strike up the band so you can get Today we're going to talk about six important steps to starting a booster organization. But I'm going to start off with telling you my bad experience. The fir- very first job I had, I was I had burned out. And when I got to my second position, I was determined not to burn out. And when I started a booster organization, I made the mistake of withdrawing completely. I told the parents once we started it, I said, I'm going to not be able to be a part of the meetings. I'm just going to leave it up to you. And I'm just here to help you get started. Well, it turned into a gripe session about Mr. Divine. And the biggest gripe was that marching bands should be required instead of optional. And that was something that they really believed in. And that's all they were doing. They weren't raising money. They weren't helping do rate to create events or put on events or anything. They were just griping every week. And the weird thing was none of their kids were in marching band. We had a very small marching band. It was our first year going and none of their kids were in it. So I don't know how it turned into this gripe session, but that was my mistake was not being involved. So one April that year in April, I got in touch with them and I told them we were dismantling the the booster organization. So I had some gripes from them, but that was okay. And then the next year I restarted it. So I think they had been parents of seniors, so it was pretty easy to restart it the next year. Let's talk about the why of starting a booster organization. It's a great fundraising opportunity and parents will bring in their own expertise that is different than your expertise. For example, my weakness is raising money. I've just been bad at it. I've never been good at it. I've never been interested in it. And I've had parents in several booster organizations that have been great at raising money and coming up with ideas and organizing events. Another why, parents are more invested when they're taking part in whatever it is that you're doing. The parents end up enlisting others. They end up doing all the work. I go to the meetings and am part of it, and I'm a member, a non-voting member of the, the board. That's how I had set it up at a school that I was at. But I found the parents really got involved um, in this. In fact, we would have a bake sale at one school I was at that almost every single parent got involved in. There was the parent who organized it, the parent who contacted other parents, and then almost everybody would bring something to the bake sale because maybe they were too busy with little kids and in their work lives to be involved in the boosters, but they wanted to do something for the, for the program. Another why is you're able to delegate things. You can't do it all. You might think you can. When you're a young teacher, you might be trying to do it all, but you really can't do it all. I heard this great advice one time. And the advice was anything that doesn't involve a music education degree should be delegated. It doesn't take a music education degree to move chairs and stands. That should be delegated to the students. I do need to help out with fingerings, so that should be something I do. I do need to organize a band event and get the the buses or whatever it is we need for it, but I don't need to fill the hot chocolate container and get that and get that poured. A student or a parent can do that. All right, so let's talk about the actual steps to getting a booster organization going. At first, you might want to garner interest. If you're the only one interested in this, you don't want to spend a lot of time on it. So some of the ways that you can do this is to reach out by email, maybe early in the school year or at the end of one school year. It's usually best to maybe try to start it at the start of a school year. Another thing is maybe at one of your concerts, maybe this year at your spring concert, you might have a sign-up sheet and say, hey, we're trying to get a booster organization going and trying to garner interest. Who might be interested in doing that? And then another way that really worked for me is when I used to have to have students return a signed syllabus, one of the things at the bottom of the form they had to return to me was ways I might be willing to help. And I listed everything there from booster or making bake sale items or organizing a bake sale or driving a trailer. I've checked all the ways or had a little checkbox where people could check the ways they were willing to help. 
Number two, you want to get three to four committed people. If you have a group of four committed people, you can make the booster organization happen. The, they're going to be the ones to get other parents involved in the actual events. Um, but they're going to be the ones who, the three or four will be the ones who, who meet. And you need, at a minimum, a president, a vice president, a secretary who keeps the notes, and a treasurer who, who provides the balance sheets and all of that. Step number three, hold your first meeting. In the, in the past, when I was part of a booster organization, we held our meetings one time a month. It was the same time, so it was always like the third Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. And at first you might think, well, now I have another thing to commit to. But when you see what a booster organization does and you realize that that one hour investment of your time each month, what it does, you would be really amazed. In fact, sometimes we would cancel our meetings when... For example, maybe the, we just met in October and we had a bake sale and things are going well and we know that the November meeting falls during a busy time, we might already decide to cancel that meeting. Step number four, elect officers. If you get four people involved, maybe you don't need an election. You just have a time where you just kind of appoint people and, and get it going. Step number five Create bylaws and don't reinvent the wheel. A quick internet search is going to pull up probably a ton of bylaws of booster organizations for band and orchestras. And so just copy one of those and then adapt it to, to your group. Change it to what you need for, for your group. I actually suggest the shorter, the better um, so many things are getting so long these days. Think about when you're asked to accept the new terms for something. It's like pages and pages. Does anybody ever ever read that? But you don't want it too short either. Um, step number six, be present and ready to articulate the needs and desires of your group. This is your group. Even though you may not have a vote in what's happening, it's best to have it be a whole separate organization in my opinion you still are the one to provide the leadership and the input and the direction. And that was my mistake early on when I was determined not to be a part of it because I thought that would lead to burnout. It just took on its own bad energy and went in directions I didn't want it to go. Step number seven, this can come later, but it can be very important, is establish a 501c3. And once you have the president and vice president they'll probably know what to do or can get going in the right direction for establishing that. You're going to find that there's some places that won't donate to you at all if you don't have this established. And there are sometimes even instrument donations. We, we were able to accept instruments from colleges, but only because we had a 501c3. Um, step number, thing number eight to consider is the booster organization should be separate from the school and you should have a separate bank account. Now, the district I taught at when I started one, they had some kind of requirement and I understand why this was important. Um, so someone had thought it out ahead of time. Our booster organization was totally separate. It was not part of the school. We didn't even have our meetings at the school just so we could be totally separate. But once the boosters bought an instrument and donated it to the school, the school made it clear that now this becomes a property item of the school. And at first you might think, well, what business is it of the school? Well, think about it. If the boosters maintained ownership of the instrument and then one day they got mad at the school or whatever and there's 20 or 30 instruments that have been bought and and purchased and used by the school they could just withdraw those and say well we don't want to have the we want to take back our instruments so i think that can actually be a very good thing and if your district doesn't already have that set up you might want to somehow include that or include it in the bylaws of your your organization um, to make it clear. I think a having a booster organization can be a very big asset to what you're doing as a band or orchestra teacher, and I encourage you to start one. The Music and Podcast, where you get quick and easy tips for how to be 
or bad.